Alrighty, so we're here in Ron's main aviary, and this is where he kind of um, doesn't really necessarily specialize in anything in particular. No, this is what's called a colony aviary. There's one, one bird up to four or five pair of different species for no real reason other than um, that's what I do. So, uh, yeah. Righty. And so this area here is particularly important. Yeah, this is what we call the shed part of an aviary. An aviary should always have a couple of components. One, a home for the bird, which becomes the shed, where they can get uh, security. Uh, they're out of the weather if they want to be. They got that choice. The temperature is reasonably constant in here. And then if they want to, they can go out there in the everyday sun, the rain, and whatever. Um, it's necessary to have both environments for your bird to, to enjoy and to survive. Um, they live in the bush and that's got its own mixture of environments from shrubs to hide in, to open grasslands, to fly across, collect food on the wick and all that sort of thing. So you need to try to provide both. Now, they, they haven't got to be at this scale. You can bring it down to you know, something as, only as wide as that. And that sort of depth, but in that you can have a little flight flat nut which is out of the open, and then a small shed just somewhere where they can get in behind or up and under. And if there's any predatory birds around, owls, cats, possums, whatever the case may be, to disturb them, they can come in here and they're secure. Uh, especially if you want to breed finches. Um, uh, the difficulty is that the bird's sitting on a nest with eggs in it, if they get frightened off that nest at night time, the eggs go cold, the embryo dies and you don't, and the birds go back and try to um, to sit on those eggs but they're wasting their time because okay. they've died off so they, they do need that, that secure if they can get it. So this aviary is mostly for both your enjoyment and the birds enjoyment? Yes, um, more so now as I'm getting older my enjoyment because there's even though this looks big, there's too many birds in here. It's, well, I've mentioned that a few times already. It's always about overcrowding our finches. And, um, they need space, especially if you mix the species. Uh, you get dominant species, and this one will pull that one's less to bits and all those sort of problems. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, awesome. Is it right if we have a look around? Hopefully you'll look. You can see some birds on the ground there. This is an Australian starfinch. They have a, a natural likeness to feed off the ground because it's normal. And, uh, we don't like them on the ground very much because the health problems. <laughs> so his nest was his nest was in in there. It's his nest in there. And all all that nest is is a wire. That that's all it is. A wire cylinder, a landing perch there, and they fill that with their grass to build a nest. I don't know whether there's any, any young ones currently in the box. I think they've fledged. That's, that's typically what a finch will build as a nest inside the box. So they line it with feathers to keep the eggs warm. There's no eggs in there, the young ones are already hatched and left. And could you explain to us why you have the nest boxes facing away? Okay, so the nest box, there's no real correct way of having a nest box. As you can see, I've got different sorts all around here. But one of the principles are, when a hen bird has got young ones or eggs, they're in there, 
the cockbird's role is to protect that space. Uh, if any, if I just had a, an open box like that one, as soon as another bird goes anywhere near it, the hen would leave that nest and tear out to chase it away. So here they've got that little alcove security and they don't, the other birds won't go and land on that. Yeah. It's just not that important. A bit of a slope on the top, that's not necessary. The theory is that uh, the birds won't land and interfere, they might slide off, but that theory went out the window a few years ago. We normally face the entrance hole away from activity. Uh, that means that either turn them sideways or backwards so that any owls or something, eagle or something flies over the birds because they'll see that shadow and they won't leave the nest. The, uh, that's Australian starfinch, they've got a nest up in their brush. That's why he's a bit anxious. That's the, that's the father. So they've got a nest buried in there. They, I think they've got young ones in there. But, um, they put it right up the dash. But that's only, that's only dead brush that they go into. That just replicates a bit of bush in the bush, a, a bushy plant they go in and build a nest. I don't know whether you can zoom, but carrying on from that comment, that stand of kangaroo grass, the tall brown grass, that's a native Australian grass, about halfway down, not the stick poking out this way, but the, the one over there, the fence, there's a nest in there with um, a pair of birds, and, um, the black nun, they've got young ones in there. So they'll build their own nest if they want to. The last time they had young ones, so from that sort of box to building their own nest, that's their choice. Yeah. Uh, you just let them do it, provide for it, if they want to use it they can. There's a nest up here. And even, um, that's the only nest that, um, that gets built, that's a natural Australian bush tree, and yet the birds of their own choice, 90% will come in here to um, breed young and to breed. So you talk about replicating um, the natural environment, the endemic environment, yep. in an aviary. Can yep. you talk a bit about the choice of plants that you have in here? Yeah. But, um, if, you, if you're just going to start off and keep birds, Forget about the aspect of trying to breed birds. Uh, you'll get very disappointed if you focus on breeding them too early because you won't have success, as you found out. Yeah. You've got to serve your apprenticeship. We don't really know why it happens, but people starting off seem to have problems. Otherwise. As you progress, you become more uh, easy with them, I suppose. But um, in that, if you just start off as a bird keeper, now, if you look at that aviary up there, you talk about habitat, forget this shed part. Yeah. But you see, there's that orange breast having a sticky bit down there on that kangaroo grass. You may be able to pick it up. Now, he's a very, very small finch. There you go. That's, that's a South African finch. They spend 90% of their time in that low plant there, that XOR. Uh, You'll notice it's reasonably dense. They get in there and not much will disturb it. It's low on the ground. Then you've got over here a wet sort of environment, a pond, uh, orchids. And that suggests dampness, rain forested. So there's birds in here that uh, come from South America and that's where they, their endemic habitat is around that rain forest area they're called the Jacarini Finch. Now that's the sort of environment so you can have that little patch for them. You can have that patch for the little orange breast and that little ruddy that was just here. You can have the open the open sand area with natural grasses. So that your Australian finch, the majority of Australian finches in the centre of Australia, the desert open plains with a few trees. So they can pick those areas. So if you can 
it gives her that choice of different landscape environments within the aviary. Um, if you're going to be a finch breeder, that's a whole different ball game. You only have that species in your aviary and your landscaping is aimed at that species. So if I just wanted to breed jacarinis, that's what I'd have. There'd be sprinklers running and there'd be palm trees and, and they breed like crazy in that. So I tend to put three or four groups together and then put their different habitats around the aviary and give them you know, that sort of what they want. A lot of birds just want open sand. There's a bird in Australia, a little finch, the uh, emblem of picta. He lives in the desert. He lives where there's just clumps of spinifex grass. That's all he needs. He, he would hate that. He just doesn't want all that dampness. He's not designed to live in that sort of environment. So yeah, you can uh, the landscaping I think is important. It should be part of your aviary. A lot of people uh, put an aviary, put a cage, they put birds in and they build it and design it so that they can see the bird like you said, you said whose enjoyment is it? Uh, it's not there for your enjoyment, it, that's, that's their life. Uh, that's where they've got to live. So you can't just have it so that the, the way you want it, it's, it's the way that they need it and they'll respond accordingly. So yeah, uh, landscaping is very, very important. Very important. And I've just noticed here, yep. you have these different compartment trays. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Can you explain the purpose of that? Uh, yeah, it looks nice, doesn't it? Yeah. No other reason. <laughs> <laughs> other than, I suppose, yeah, I suppose there is a reason. Now, tomorrow, that'll be, get replenished. All this has been thrown out today. And I can see, uh, is, that, is that just husk? Have they eaten it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it gives me an idea of just what they're eating at that time okay, because yes. it's not a matter of, it's not a matter of just giving them bird seed yeah. um, five days a week 365 days a year that, that sounds great yeah look at the birds on feeding them well but in that bird's lifestyle uh, for the month of February he in his own environment possibly lives on French, French white millet yeah. because the nutrients in there are tied to his genetics that he wants or his physiology in February. But come September, he's doing an entirely different thing. He's not breeding. Yeah. He's flying around as a flock and they're just doing their thing. And they don't need that sort of, they need a different seed. They need a different set of nutrients yeah. if they're going to breed. They'll stay alive. Once again, there's keep of this breeder mix. Yeah. And their seed here, now this is a commercial mix. It's there to keep them alive. And you can see the predominance of seed that's been left. It's called panorama seed. Now all that there, all that is panorama, it won't get eaten. Yeah. And you can see it just sitting here. The birds refuse to eat it. And it's becoming a problem that commercial mixes are, you know, well, the last check I did, 68% of their mix is that seed called panorama and it's hopeless. And, um, the current drought is causing all sorts of troubles getting these sorts of seeds that the birds want. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's that's the only reason it's separate. Um, just so I can keep a bit of a track on what they're eating and what they're not. Uh, that is there as a bulk seed just to keep them alive. Uh, it's, there's always seed in case something happens to me and I'm not available today or whatever. Whatever reason I couldn't get down here, at least there's seed there. Yeah. This is important, it catches all the husk. It looks messy, but it catches all the husk when the birds take the husk off the seed to eat from the Rather in here than on the floor. Like some have got on the floor. Oh, okay, yeah. That's the last thing you want. Yeah. That that gets done every two days, that gets all swept up and collected because that gets on the floor. Uh, it um, attracts vermin, mice, cockroaches, all those sorts of things. And it also absorbs moisture. Uh, and once you get something wet, then you get bacteria. Yep. So your aviary should be aimed at doing whatever you can to keep it fundamentally dry. Uh, sensibly, that's now getting wet because it's raining. But that's all 
drain so that water goes straight down into the drains and doesn't become waterlogged. So you don't get disease, you don't get bacteria growing, you don't get it in here. There's no seed husk out there. But if I was to leave that for a week or two, that, that would absorb the moisture from the rain just in the air. Mm. And uh, that's that's problems. That's All right. problems. Thanks, you're right. Thank so you. there, you can keep going forever, but it all gets down to those things you asked me up there. What do you, you start off with making up your mind for a little while, I'll just be a bird keeper. Yep. Get a couple of pair of relatively cheap ones, colourful ones, and see what they do. Yep. If they breed, then you you try something else. You go and see people's avies. Oh, do you like to have something like that? Yeah. But you need space. Yep. Right. You need space. And I guess the key is you got to put your enjoyment first. And you got to obviously make sure your birds are happy, but yep. at the end of the day, it comes to the keeper, and you've got to keep interested in the hobby. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a funny hobby. It's not something you just, you kind of play football, you're going to play cricket, whatever. Yeah. You do that. But this is entirely, you're relying on something else happening yeah. for you to get enjoyment. Yeah. And you've just got to provide all the requirements to allow that thing to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's great. Um, there's all sorts of angles that come into it. We've done a survey on our Finch Club and predominantly our membership structure uh, is 50 to 60 year old and onwards. If you look at our graph, 60, 70% of our people are in that age bracket. Yep. So we're desperately trying to put something behind them as they fall off the perch 10 years time sort of thing. There's very few people coming on to keep the agricultural hobby going. Of course, the less people in it means the less birds that are bred. Um, if you don't keep birds breeding and keep a genetic base, a spread of genetics, you finish up with inbreeding with the few birds that are available. As soon as you start to inbreed, you get genetic faults. The birds can't fly properly, they can't breed properly, they become less and less. And then you see what's happening right across the world, uh, that things disappear. Mm whole species will just disappear because they just have lost their environment to breeding and yep. that's all it comes down to. Yeah. We're imposing on their habitat, changing it, and the birds can't, or most animals can't um, acclimatise to it. Yep. So just what we do, um, it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're thinking about keeping finches and you meet the criteria that Ron's given us today, you know, just go for it. Because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a great hobby to be in, and we don't want the hobby to die. So and we don't want the species to disappear. Exactly. And uh, let's not get too carried away. We're talking currently all the focus on the coal mines and all that, taking the environment. But that that's that's politically the wrong thing. Uh, the very birds that we're concerned about in that area used to be in northern. New South Wales. Now they moved from there and that's simply because um, we had to farm the land that they used to breed in because we've got to feed the people. So without the farms you've got no food for the people. So it always comes a balance. It's all very nice saying, oh we've got to protect the species irrespective of come what what. But if you want to live on the earth as well, <laughs> you need space, you need food. Yeah. And uh, so it's always very important to, to keep that balance in mind. And in doing that, that's why I mentioned that fact of inbreeding. There's an awful lot of mutations uh, being bred. And you'll find those if you've got a young people who want to get involved, they're very colourful, yeah. but they're genetically weak and they won't sustain the species. So, uh, Alright, thanks for the advice, Ron. Yeah, okay, well, that's yeah. fair. Uh, space, volume, number of babies. Yeah. I always say, Build as big as you can when you can. Yeah. <laughs> and while the space is available, always keep in mind if they do breed you see all they should half of these birds should be out of here. Yeah. But my holding cage now is full because I've got another person's birds in my dick. So I've got to leave them in here. Now that overcrowds. I would have lots of another series of young ones, but I think they will have... I think they've left in the last couple of days, I think they've left. 
There's a mess with eggs in. Those so are Gouldian eggs? They'll be Gouldian eggs. Yep. Yeah, that's not a big bird and yet they're pretty big eggs. Yeah. And there's six eggs in there, they take a bit of covering. So, uh, yeah, stone cold, so they've been left. So, um, for whatever reason, those eggs are no good. They've got to, they've got to be kept warm for a fortnight. And then after a fortnight, they need three weeks before the young ones can leave the rest. So in five weeks they need the young ones are wet, but that'll all get cleaned out there. You can see the mess they make. One nest full of yeah, there's about four girlins in here, they've all come out. I think there was one flying around here somewhere. Is here. Yeah, that's great. So that's that's the maggots I spoke about compared to the mealworm. So definitely much smaller. A lot smaller. Yeah. And do the birds prefer that over mealworms? Um Hard, hard question, because once, once again, uh, nominate a monthly year. Yeah. Nominate what they're doing okay. uh, at that stage. Nominate the size of the bird. I've got colony birds. I've got birds that will take mealworms, and I've also got the little blokes that will take the maggots. Yeah. So it's uh, horses for courses. But, um, but see, there's nothing wrong with that getting wet. Because standing out there now it's raining, now that, those birds have got it, if they're living in the wild, they've got to eat somewhere tonight. The fact that it's raining, they can't just go around and stop in the doors. They've yeah. got to find, they've got to come down the grass and they've got to find food. Yeah. So they'll eat wet food. So they, don't, they have no option. So it's all about provide the habitat if you can and make that complementary to the environment the birds and the part of the Part of the excitement and the thrill of having birds is to then research the environment that they came from, the habitat, where's their, where were they designed to live, in the middle of Africa, in the middle of Mexico, and you look at what, what grows there, what food sources there, what sort of seeds, what sort of grasses grow there, yeah. and that's just, that's, if you're going to have those birds, you try as best you can replicate that you won't always do it mm. and then you're up for just buying finch food from boobers or somewhere yeah. your birds will live but don't expect them to breed yeah. okay. because they're not getting the nutrition they need from their in and they're designed to require it and not like chooks the you know, battery chooks nowadays and fowls their um, design and their physiology is to lay a million eggs mm. or to get fat for the meat trunk. So they're fed and bred accordingly. That's a Fijian bird, the red faced parrot fish. Mm. It comes from the Fiji Islands and Java and all that Indonesia and down into Fiji. The ruddies come from South Africa. There's a whole range of of um, little birds come out of South Africa. I don't know why. 